Welcome to the Live to 110 podcast. My name is Wendy Myers, and you can find me on LiveTo110.com. And today I'm really excited. I have Jordan Reasoner from SCDLifestyle.com, and uh, we're going to be talking about poop. So for you, you guys that are a little squeamish out there, this is not, might not be the show for you. Um, but we're going to be talking about how to have the perfect poop and how to get rid of IBS and heal your gut because uh, digestive issues are a big problem with a lot of my clients and a lot of you listeners out there it's a big epidemic uh, people have uh, so many digestive issues for various reasons so we're going to get down to the bottom of it today um, but first we have to do the, the disclaimer um, if I can say that please keep in mind that this podcast is not intended to diagnose or treat any disease or health condition and the live to 110 podcast is solely informational in nature and for entertainment purposes so please consult your healthcare practitioner before uh, engaging in any diet or treatment that we suggest on the show and if you guys want to sign up for uh, for my website on live2110.com you, there's a million little places you can sign up to get my free live to 110 by weighing less e-guide and my free modern paleo survival guides um, it has charts on fats and oils and foods that are on the modern paleo diet versus the paleo diet and it gives you a little taste a little preview of coming attractions of my new upcoming book the modern paleo survival guide Today, our guest is Jordan Reisner. Um, he is a mechanical engineer turned health engineer. Um, celiac disease almost killed him in 2007, um, but he transformed his health using the specific carbohydrate diet, SCD carbohydrate diet, and saved his life. Since then, he's known for starting scdlifestyle.com with Stephen Wright. You may know him, he hosts the uh, Chris Kresser podcast. Um, he also, uh, together they help others naturally overcome chronic digestive problems and enjoy perfect poops. And he lives in Bozeman, Montana with his two children. So thank you for coming on the show, Jordan. Thanks for having me, Wendy. I'm excited. I always like to put the word poop in my bio so that uh, all the hosts <laughs> have to say it, you know, right away. Get it out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> I just get them indoctrinated into poop. Um, so why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and um, how you finally had perfect poops and um, and how you, you know, kind of discovered the SCD lifestyle. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm always humbled to be on shows like this. Uh, I mean, I'm, I still, I'm just a regular dude. And back in 2007, I was literally having diarrhea like 10 to 15 times a day. And my doctors just had no idea. They were just throwing their hands up and they put me on some prescriptions for IBS and things like that. And I had to really fight to get a, a colonoscopy. And when I got a, a colonoscopy, they again, they woke me up. I came out of the thing and they said, you're fine. There's nothing wrong. No ulcerative colitis, no Crohn's. But yet I had, you know, low energy. I was having a hard time going to work every day, falling asleep at work. Uh, the diarrhea was just absurd. And, uh, you know, I had all these other issues, depression, my hair was falling out. You know, all those fun things. I had acne and I just felt like crap. And, uh, and when, they, when they pulled me out of the, the colonoscopy, they said, we'll, we'll ran some biopsies, we'll let you know. So three weeks later, I got a packet in the mail that said, Jordan, you have celiac disease, just eat gluten free and you'll be fine. And uh, inside were some like 1990s pamphlets on gluten and, <laughs> you know, what it is. And, and not a phone call or anything, just just a pamphlet in the mail. And uh, I thought, wow, okay, I finally know what's wrong with me. If I just, you know, eat gluten free, I'm going to be fine. And I did that really strict for a long time, and I didn't get any better. And it got so bad that I always talk about this. This one night when things were so bad, I, I stayed up late. My son, he was one at the time, and I, like, you know, it's funny to be on a Live to One Ten podcast because. Mm -hmm. My body was just falling apart. I thought, like, live to 28, you know. Yeah, I'll be lucky. <laughs> yeah, maybe great. So that night I stayed up late and I literally, I was like 23 years old. And I thought, okay, this is, I'm not going to live very long. And I literally wrote my will because I didn't have a will. I was 23 years old, you know. And uh, I just graduated college like a year before that. So I wrote my will in a piece of notebook paper. And then in the morning, I gave it to my wife. And I, I just was like, I don't have a will, but I feel like you need this. I don't think I'm going to be around much longer. And and then later that day, that I kind of flipped the mindset and I decided that wasn't going to happen to me. I wasn't going to die. I wasn't going to be a victim of celiac disease. And I just started Googling. <laughs> and eventually I found a specific carbohydrate diet. 
uh, you know, I, I decided to start it. And seven days later, my diarrhea finally stopped for the first time in years. And that was the first step in probably a thousand of steps since then. But uh, I feel like now potentially could live to be 110. Yeah. And uh, it's, a, it's a profound thing for me to be sitting here on this podcast with you talking about this when back then I had to handwrite my will because I didn't think I'd live very long. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a, that's a profound place to be in. And I think there's a lot of people out there really suffering. And the doctors have no idea. They, I, I have a girlfriend who has IBS. She's constantly in and out of the doctors. And I want to give her all kinds of medications. And it's, it's extremely frustrating. And there's so many answers out there. And so why don't you tell us a little bit about some of the answers that you found. Um, so what exactly is the specific carbohydrate diet? Yeah, the specific carbohydrate diet... Um, we, we could kind of call it the, the little brother to paleo. And uh, in general, it's a, it's a really gut healing specific diet, similar to GAPS. GAPS was built off of the foundation of the specific carbohydrate diet. And, and you know, we're talking about eating real food, really, when it comes down to it. whatever the name is, GAPS, Weston A. Price, paleo. And as we look at this, I mean, the specific carbohydrate diet, it pulls out all grains, just like paleo, just like, you know, GAPS does. But it allows some 24-hour fermented yogurts and things like that that are lactose-free dairy products. It also allows legumes to some extent. And uh, it, it pulls out, say, starches. So it pulls out things like sweet potatoes and yams and, and really just tries to get you focused on eating. Um, the only source of carbohydrates are monosaccharides, so one sugar molecule. So you know the natural sugars in fruit or the natural sugars in honey, things like that rather than the complex sugars that might be in a sweet potato or a yam or something like that. And it really focuses on pulling those things out, the single sugars that are difficult to break down if you have a lot of damage in your gut like I did, and, and really helps you begin to heal the gut. And we like to help people create a custom diet that's going to work for them. I don't think there's any real diet that's going to work for everybody. It really ended up being the Jordan diet and the Steve diet, and there's probably a Wendy diet. and everybody has to create their own custom version of these types of things and so we like to see people create their custom version of whatever might be like SCD as a foundation for example and then graduating up to maybe a paleo type diet for long-term gut health um, maybe a year or so on SCD and graduate up after that so it's really a journey it's a journey and, and I would say that I was on you know SCD for maybe two years and then graduated up to paleo I brought say starches back in because they're very important for long-term gut health, you know, and that type of thing. So I, I really think that that gives you a little high-level overview of what SCD is with the caveat that uh, we really want to encourage people to create their own custom diet that's going to work for them. And I think I, I love that you said that you stayed on it for two years because I think a lot of people have unrealistic expectations that when they have gut issues like this, it takes a long time to heal and to get over to get rid of those food sensitivities that were being caused by leaky gut and um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about the healing process and why that takes so long oh man I, I pureed my fruits and vegetables for for an entire year wow. and uh, so I would I would peel and de-seed fruits and vegetables and then I cook them so they're really well cooked and then I would make baby food basically and it was really funny because my son was, you know, one at the time. So he was just getting into real food and he was still breastfeeding at the same time. So I would make myself some pureed, you know, squash and dump some on his plate too, you know, <laughs> and we eat together. And at the time, I could have cared less because I wasn't having diarrhea anymore. <laughs> it was like a miracle. So for me, I would have eaten whatever it would have taken at that point. But my gut was so damaged from full-blown celiac that it really took a long time for me to just be able to eat like a raw piece of cucumber, for example. I mean, that took years. Yeah. So I think the healing process really, it's almost three steps. And step one is you really have to remove the triggers, whatever those might be. So, for example, like there's 19 really common triggers that we've looked at. Uh, that can damage the gut, cause leaky gut and inflammation and things like that. You know, grains being one of them, especially gluten, for example. You know, pulling out those triggers, um, chronic NSAID use, chronic alcohol consumption, um, those types of things that are going to really continue to, to damage your gut as you're trying to fix it. So if you can pull out the most common triggers, if you can change your diet to a real food type diet, that's really step one. And then step two is to rebuild it. And rebuilding it involves, you know, 
really anti-inflammatory, nutrient-dense food, like a paleo diet, for example. And I think it's important for people to eat that way in order to heal their gut. But it still goes beyond that even further. And I think this is where a lot of people miss, which is that I don't think diet alone is enough to really rebuild a gut that's damaged like mine was. And the healing process really involves not only food, but some supplements. You know, some people really commonly need digestive enzymes, for example. That's a common one that can really just, just light switch, turn someone's digestion around if they're really struggling. And for me, I mean, overnight, the next day, enzymes helped me immediately with uh, digesting food better, uh, boosted my energy, and I was starting to have better solid formed bowel movements, yeah. which was nice. And then a lot of people have low stomach acid, so B10HCL is a really common uh, supplement that a lot of people with gut problems have to have in order to digest meat well. A lot of people come to these real food types of diets and they don't digest meat well, and so sometimes they'll feel worse on yeah. these types of diets, which really sucks because it's like you came to a diet where you're supposed to be eating really great food and you just feel worse or your GERD or acid reflux gets worse. A lot of times low stomach acid is, is the culprit there. So those two supplements are really important. And then I think the the third step is really what are the root causes, you know, really addressing the root causes. and. There's so many, uh, but I'll share two of the root causes that were going on in my body that helped me finally begin to really heal my gut long term. And number one was gut infections. So I had two. I ended up finding I had a parasite called strongyloides, and also had H. pylori, uh, and I also had small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And so those three types of infections needed to be treated for me to really make some leaps and bounds and stop hearing my food, for example. <laughs> and uh, be able to go to restaurants again, you know, that type of thing. And then I also really struggled with adrenal fatigue, which is a common one that many people with chronic illness struggle with. You know, I had really low cortisol, like 30% of the cortisol level of a healthy person. And so working with a skilled practitioner and handling adrenal fatigue was just part of the process. So those are the really the three steps. Remove the triggers, start to rebuild with some good diet and supplement and lifestyle changes. And then the third really important thing is that you circle back on this journey and, and start to check off some root causes. You know, How did you get there in the first place? What got you sick? Why are you in this position? And uh, that's what a lot of people miss, I think. Yeah, yeah. that's what one thing I do on my program called Mineral Power. Um, I use a hair mineral analysis to figure out the nutrients that people need. And when they uh, get on this type of program, they're doing detox and supplementation and diet, very paleo diet. And uh, it's amazing. Their their guts start healing, and their um, their food sensitivities start going away, and um, and their, it heals adrenal fatigue as well. And I think uh, it's one of those things that you have to treat so many different factors. Um, it's not just about the gut and targeting the gut, so to speak. You have to heal your whole body. Well said. Yeah. 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 And so uh, something that um, you said struck me. You said that people with digestive issues need digestive enzymes. Is there a point of diminishing returns where maybe if they take continue to take those long term where they could possibly have uh, not be producing enough of their own enzymes or is it a supplement you think is okay to take for a long time, long term? I've been asked that so many times over the years and I'll tell you there's not a lot of research that I've personally been able to dig up on it. I found one, one animal study uh, where they found that after a couple weeks of backing off of enzymes that the the participants, I think they were actually swine, uh, had normal uh, normal restoration of enzyme production or natural enzyme production, but I haven't found a lot of human-based studies that I, I rely on. What I can say is that in my personal experience working with so many people over the years, I, I haven't seen it become a problem, but I think it goes back to what's the root cause? Why are you insufficient in enzymes? You know, is it gallbladder insufficiency? Do you literally have, you know, brush border uh, damage like I did from celiac disease where your brush border enzyme production is poor? Do you have a low stomach acid in that, you know, stomach acid plays a critical role in the pH level being perfect when it hits your small intestine and bile salts get released. All these things are kind of a cascading event triggering the proper enzyme production. All those types of things happen when stomach acid is perfect. So is it, a, is it an upline problem? Meaning, you know, maybe you have a little stomach acid and that's why your enzyme production is poor. Um, did you have your gallbladder removed? Uh, I mean, there's all these different types of root causes. There's different enzymes we're talking about. You know, there's different brush water enzymes versus what's released from the gallbladder. Those types of things are very different. So 
when we're talking about enzyme production and taking digestive enzymes, some people have to be on them for life. Some people have a root cause that is going to require them to supplement for the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. And some people can take them for a while and maybe, for example, they get their stomach acid levels back to normal. Maybe an H. pylori infection is why their stomach acid was suppressed. So they treat that, stomach acid comes back to normal, natural levels, they're digesting well, everything down the line starts to work better and they don't need enzymes anymore. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's really a, a thing where I encourage people to try enzymes. And for me, if, you know, if I have to take enzymes for life to digest food well and feel great and live a long, healthy, happy life, I'm totally okay with that uh, yeah. because of what I've been through. Yeah. You know? And so for me to think twice about taking enzymes when A, it makes me feel great and B, uh, I'm so much better off than I was before I took them. For me, it's a, a no-brainer to take that to take that choice and uh, I really want people to look at what's the root cause of why you need enzymes in the first place before you start to think about you know is this gonna is this gonna impact my natural levels long term because it's like well maybe but if you have natural insufficiencies anyway then what difference does it make yeah yeah I take digestive enzymes and uh, I recommend them to all my clients because I a few years ago I was diagnosed with H. pylori and uh, I started, after that, I started taking uh, HCL with betaine and I started taking uh, digestive enzymes and I was able to stop the, the HCL after about six months. Um, but, but yeah, because I felt I had lowered stomach acid. Uh, but yeah, I love the digestive enzymes, so I take them. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I go a week here and there, sometimes I don't take them and I'm, I'm okay. Um, they don't, it doesn't really bother me, but I think, uh, you know, for some people it's a really good idea to take them for life, for sure. Yeah. Definitely. And so another thing you said was that you couldn't digest a cucumber, you know, which is a, a <laughs> raw food. Um, so for people that are uh, healing their guts, trying to heal their leaky gut, what is your take on raw vegetables versus cooked vegetables? What should they be eating? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, again, we have to create a custom diet. So there are some people that just cannot tolerate raw vegetables right now in their life. And why is that is the first question I always ask why what's the root cause here and a lot of times we're dealing with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth um, you know if you've been diagnosed with IBS D or IBS C um, there's a lot of different research out there but anywhere from 30 to 60 percent of people with IBS test positive for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth depends on which study you read <laughs> but Primarily, uh, people who are having IBS diarrhea predominant are more likely to have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And um, in general, when you're talking about dealing with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, a lot of times when you feed uh, raw vegetables, for example, um, it just makes the bacteria go nuts and aggravates your symptoms. And a lot of times it depends, you know, whether you are someone who's dealing with. Uh, hydrogen releasing bacteria or methane releasing bacteria it depends on which whether you have constipation or diarrhea but your symptoms will really aggravate when you eat uh, raw vegetables for example so a lot of times people have to take their foundational diet whether it's paleo or gaps or western a price or scd and then tweak it to be low fodmap and don't make me say the definition of fodmap on the air because i will but <laughs> <I won't. it. laughs> to this day i just cannot get it just go look it up but, people if you want yeah to yeah so low fodmap fruits and vegetables can be really helpful and taking it to the next level and peeling and de-seeding removes a lot of the really fibrous materials that can aggravate symptoms and then cooking also breaks down and, and makes it uh, even more well tolerated and then pureeing just takes it to the next level but I don't, I don't really recommend that unless you're somebody like me who's having extreme diarrhea and just really life-threatening stuff if you're just having some gas and bloating you probably don't need to go to that extent but if you eat a, a lower FODMAP custom version of your diet, a lot of times that can really help. And just, you know, low FODMAP can be complicated for some people. If you look it up, you'll find charts on any website about what is a high FODMAP fruit and vegetable. And it's really like, think about it, the things with more fibers. For example, like cauliflower and broccoli are going to have way more of a FODMAP problem for people than, you know, a cucumber or a zucchini. They are just more fibrous in general. And so, 
first of all, one of the most important things you can do is anytime you peel and deseed, you're going to remove, you're going to make it lower FODMAP inherently. And then uh, a lot of times cooking can really help too. So a low FODMAP tweak for people with IBS or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth can be really helpful, a really, a really powerful customization. And it can be really uh, almost maddening to try to mix all these different diets because there is a low FODMAP diet. And so if you're trying to mix FODMAP with paleo, with SCD, with GAPS, it can just drive you insane. <laughs> and I think the take-home point is eat less fibrous stuff and peel and de-seed and, and cook stuff if you have to for a while. And it's going to make your symptoms improve a lot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so uh, so let's talk about a little bit about IBS and what it is exactly. Because I think when people go to their doctors or having digestive issues... The doctor just, oh, oh, it's IBS, and when they, it's just a garbage can term when they really don't know what the hell is wrong with you. Um, so, what exactly, uh, what exactly is IBS? Yeah, it's a, it's a diagnosis of symptoms, basically. Um, you know, as a comparison to like celiac disease that I was diagnosed with, where there's an overt immune response destroying the lining of my gut. That's a specific condition that's happening in my body. Um, uh, irritable bowel syndrome is really a diagnosis of you have this checklist of symptoms, we've ruled out these other things, okay, you have, by default, IBS. So it could be a lot of different things. You know, it doesn't always mean small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, like I said. It's depending on the population studies that you look at. Sometimes it's 30% of the people test positive for SIBO. A lot of times in the, the IBS, um, diarrhea predominant people, they'll be up to 60% positive for SIBO. So it is a rule out diagnosis. It means you are having either some really uncomfortable diarrhea predominant symptoms or some really uncomfortable constipation predominant symptoms. And uh, Dr. Elson Seebecker is one of our great friends and she does a, a great job putting together the, the website siboinfo.com. And it's really one of the number one resources out there for SIBO. And, and I would say, you know, after knowing her for years and just talking to her for years, it's a it's one of those things. It's not always SIBO. It's not always gut infections. Um, I think you really have to look at IBS as a root cause hunt. So you've been diagnosed with this thing. It just means that you're either having lots of GI discomfort that's either diarrhea or constipation based. And, uh, and, and you, you need to kind of work with a skilled practitioner to, to go on a root cause hunt. Is it SIBO? Now, I've seen a ton of people, I've worked with a ton of people who SIBO was, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, was the primary cause of their, uh, of their IBS symptoms. And so the root cause hunt was a positive uh, breath test for SIBO. They did an herbal protocol to kill it and retest, found it was gone, and their symptoms were much improved. And they were able to really open up their, their diet at that point. They were able to bring safe starches in and graduate up to paleo, for example. In some cases, they were negative for SIBO and started doing some, some stool testing and found H. pylori antigen. So they were positive for H. pylori and, and that was contributing to it. And sometimes it's, it's seriously just a diet-based reaction. So you've got some you know, inflamed conditions going on in the gut because you're eating gluten or because you're eating all grains or you know, because you've got a low stomach acid and, and enzyme insufficiency. So I think anytime people are diagnosed with IBS, um, and specifically like prescribed medications like Bento, like I was, that just don't work. It's frustrating and it's depressing. And what I would say is that, okay, that gives you the green light to start to root cause hunt and try to figure out, okay, do a SIBO test. Is it SIBO? Do a stool test. Look for pathogens. Do, uh, you know, some trials, some, some testing with supplements, you know, low stomach acid. Look at enzyme insufficiency, those types of things, and try to figure out, what are the root cause or more than one root causes that are contributing to this group of symptoms, which has been called IBS in your case? And what about testing for celiac disease? Isn't there, aren't there a lot of weaknesses in the typical doctor, the tests you get at your doctor's office? Um, like yeah. some of the, the tests, I've had a, a number of people go, go to the doctor and they get this simple blood test and the doctor says, oh, you don't have celiac, that you can eat gluten now. And so what, what do you say to those people and what, what is the best celiac test that you should get? <laughs> That's a tough question. Um, <laughs> I've been over this and over this over the years, and, and I would say the big aha that I had is the gold standard celiac test is a, is a 
is an endoscopy biopsy of the small intestine, right? They come in through your mouth, they take a biopsy and they send it to the lab and they look for partial or full villus atrophy, meaning, you know, the villi and the fingers in your small intestine have been destroyed. Um, that's what I had. I had full-blown villus atrophy. And the scary thing about that, the thing that blew my mind is when I learned about the marsh ratings of celiac disease and, and really the science of what that means, that's like full-blown end-stage disease. That's like when they find stage three cancer in your toast. Right? Yeah. You have like a month to live. Yeah, because a lot disease. of the tests, they, they you have to have 80% villi atrophy before they diagnose you with celiac. And, and it's that, like, how sick the, do you yeah. got to be? And that's you know? the thing. It's like, that's end-stage disease. So I was diagnosed in full-blown end-stage celiac disease. And there's some, I forget the data off the top of my head on the spot, but there's some pretty scary data about how many people die within five years of getting that diagnosis. It's really alarming. And uh, in general, the blood test, a lot of unreliability there. Um, I think the most powerful uh, test that I've seen is there's some saliva testing that, uh, that Cyrex Labs has that's really powerful that can test for reactions to like 33 different gluten peptides. And that can be helpful. The other thing they'll do is they'll look for intraepithelial inflammation, which is um, something that's important. If you have, you know, the, the, if you've got that level of inflammation going on, that's like, let's try and catch it in the beginning, the beginning stages of the disease before you've got a bunch of damage happening and, and those atrophy happening. So there's some really cool stuff happening with Cyrex Labs and, and the direction they're going with some of the, the testing that they can, that they can do now. I haven't seen a lot of peer-reviewed research behind it other than some studies that they've done themselves, which could be totally legit. It's just you always have to put on your kind of skeptical hat when it's done by the company. So I think there's a lot of growth in this area that can happen still. Um, I would say that I don't like the gold standard being the biopsy like I had because that's end-stage disease. That's like sometimes it takes up to 10 years, in, and they've done studies on this. Sometimes it takes up to 10 years to get to that place. So you've had 10 years of the disease developing before you finally got to positive celiac disease. And uh, in my opinion, I don't think you can make a full educated decision just off of a blood test because of the unreliabilities that are there. And the other frustrating thing is they tell you to eat gluten um, to, to do the test. And a lot of times that makes people really sick. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's one of those things like you know, it's, it's tough. If you, if you pull gluten out and you feel great, and then you eat gluten and you feel bad, why don't you just assume you have celiac for now? Stay off of it for a while. Maybe do some genetic testing. Maybe do some saliva testing. See what comes up and do some, some exploration. I don't think there's a good, solid, gold standard answer for anybody right now other than what your body tells you when you eat it and when you don't eat it. And whether you're having an inflammatory-based response or an autoimmune response. You know, there's, there's spectrums of gluten sensitivity, right? Um, some respond in inflammation, some respond in a, a literal autoimmune response and they're full-blown celiacs. I think that that's really a difficult thing to, to measure right now, to know for sure right now, maybe someday. But um, in general, I think if you're on the spectrum, whether it's an autoimmune response or just an inflammatory response and you feel bad when you eat it, I think there's your answer, don't eat it, yeah. you know? Yeah, and so what is your kind of protocol, your general protocol that you give uh, clients to follow when they're trying to heal their gut? Um, are there any, like, some just specific no foods that are just completely off limits? I think grains is number one. I mean, everybody should, should pull grains out. And I think that's our general protocol is you have to create a custom diet that works for you. So we've all heard of elimination diets and probably tried elimination diets. I about went insane trying an elimination diet. I was like gluten-free, egg-free, dairy-free, soy-free, corn-free, sugar-free. <laughs> I don't even know what I'm eating anymore. There are, it's um, hard to do. All, all, all that's left is meat and vegetables. That's yeah, it. so I think it's in general the, the best protocol is to almost do a reverse elimination diet. Where, where What we have people do is go down to like a core group of, of safe foods and a lot of times we call that like an intro diet, you know, three to five days. Just focus on eating like a bone broth or like a chicken broth soup, uh, you know, really well tolerated fruits and vegetables, you know, like uh, cooked, well cooked apples, well cooked cucumbers and those types of things, squashes. 
And just focus on those foods for the first three to five days. Just, just reset your gut. Do a little reset and eat those foods that are commonly, you know, part of most people's food safe zone, we call it. And, and so you've, you've got this core group of meats, fruits, vegetables, and healthy fats that you know are going to help you feel good. And then you build on it. So what does the Jordan diet look like? Let me introduce, you know, let, let me introduce this 24-hour yogurt or let me introduce these eggs or let me introduce nuts. Let me see how I feel on these foods. So you've got a core group of, of, of safe foods that, you know, make you feel really good. You've done this kind of five-day reset. As you're going out from there, you can bring in different types of foods. We tend to people have people bring them in for like three to four days and really just try not to change too much else. Bring in eggs, for example, for three, four days. See how you feel. If you notice you feel worse, then eggs probably aren't a good fit for you right now. And uh, and then as you're building out, you know, over the next 60 days, you'll have a pretty wide swath of a diet by the end of the 60 days that, that makes you feel good. And you know because you've tested the food, you brought it in, you know it didn't make you feel worse. If it did, you pulled it back out. Um, I think in general, uh, safe starches are really important to bring in, things like sweet potatoes and yams. We know from the research that it's really important for long-term healthy gut microbiota, gut flora. They need that food to to be sustained. And in general, I think a lot of people end up on low-carb diets like SCD or GAPS for way too long. Now, I think it makes a lot of sense when you have something like SIBO, because if you have SIBO and you eat a lot of, say, starches, a lot of times that can really aggravate your symptoms. I mean, you're just feeding these complex sugars to the bacteria and you're having a hard time breaking them down probably. So I think it makes a lot of sense that people who are battling SIBO and things like that to, to leave those out for a while, be lower carb, heal your gut up a little bit, try to treat that infection if you have it, and then bring them in. Bring them in with a three-day rule just like anything else. Bring them in for three days and see how you feel. And so uh, that's really our... our our ethos, you know, create the custom diet that's going to work for you and build it yourself by testing things. And what I would say is the most problematic real food uh, groups that, that cause the most problems for people. So whether it's paleo, GAPS, West Sunny Price, SCD, people a lot of times eat these four horsemen, we call them. And they seem like perfectly good, healthy foods, but a lot of times they trigger a lot of problems. And number one is eggs. If you have a leaky gut, for example, a lot of times people have a lot of reaction to the protein in egg. So if you're having a lot of problems and you're not sure why, egg might be something to pull out for a couple of days and see how you feel. Another one is dairy. If you're eating, you know, fermented dairy or, um, you know, hard cheeses, things like that, or even raw milk, a lot of times dairy is really problematic. The casein protein. It's very reactive for people with leaky gut. Another one is nuts and nut flours. This is a classic problem when people transition to this type of real food diet. A lot of times they'll still make breads and muffins and almond milks. And I mean, they'll just be eating nuts and nut flours, even just for snacks, like all day long. And you look at it and you're like, wow, a healthy person with a perfectly good gut would have diarrhea if they ate this many nuts too. Yeah, yeah. You know, like that's another really common pitfall. And then the last one is like too much fruit and honey. And so a lot of times when people move to these types of diets, they'll start to snack on lots of fruits, they'll put honey on everything. It's like fair game. And a lot of times you look at it and you're like, wow, you ate 17 apples today. That's a little aggressive. <laughs> you know, I'm exaggerating, but you get what I mean. It's like same thing with nuts. So those are the four horsemen that we call them. And I think a lot of people, if they're listening to this right now and they're feeling like crap on a healthy diet or a real food diet, uh, those are the four horsemen to look at pulling out first. If you feel better when you pull them out, then you know what's really going on. You can test them later. Um, but that's a really common pattern that we see for people. Yeah, I like what you said about how the SCD lifestyle diet or the GAPS diet, um, that there is a point of diminishing returns and that these aren't diets you stay on long term. Because I think people will they'll feel better initially on these type of diets for a few months. And then um, depending on how strict they're doing them, and then at some point they're, they're going backward. You know, because it's uh, they're not getting the nutrients that their body needs, and uh, at some point they need to stop and introduce more foods. Well said. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so, why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about uh, probiotics? I think this is a you know, a, a, you know, there's a little bit of debate out there as to whether probiotics really help to heal the gut and if they're 
are they transitory or not? And also, what's the skinny on probiotics exactly? I think the research that I trust at this point is starting to show that they have a bigger benefit on the immune system than actually, you know, replacing your gut flora. Um, you know, I used to think years ago, like, oh, I have low bifidobacteria. I need to take bifidobacteria, and it's going to replace it or help replenish it, and that's just not true. Um, the real way we can help nourish and change our gut flora a lot of times is through the diet that we eat um, if we're feeding it good food. And, you know, earlier I mentioned safe starches, for example. Uh, the soluble fiber and safe starches are a great way to nourish good, healthy gut flora. But if you can't tolerate it and it aggravates your system right now or you can't digest it, those things are not going to help. So when it comes to probiotics, I do think they're important. What I would say is that I've seen them cause a lot of problems with people with gut problems. Um, and that's the sad thing is a lot of us think that if I have IBS or if I have SIBO or if I have these gut problems, I need to take probiotics. You know, my gut flora is messed up. Or they see test results that say their gut flora is messed up. And they'll try to take, you know, sauerkraut, fermented foods. They'll try to drink, you know, fermented drinks. Or they'll just buy and spend tons of money on multi-strain probiotics and VSL-3 and all these things. And I think there are a group of people out there that benefit a lot from these types of probiotics. I mean, there's a lot of research out there that show that probiotics help some people with IBS. Um, but I don't think that it's a sweeping thing that works for everybody with IBS, for example, or everybody with celiac. I think one of the most important things is if you have gut issues and you try probiotics and they make you feel worse, then you probably shouldn't take them. And there's a lot of different reasons as to why. Um, you know, there's Chris Kresser's often talking about the fact that, um, you know, some people don't uh, tolerate certain types of probiotics depending on the, the type of bacteria that's overgrowing in the gut. You know, any bacteria overgrowing in the small intestine is bad news. It could be good bacteria, it could be bad bacteria, it could be benign bacteria. If it's overgrown there, it shouldn't be there. It's wrong place. So if you have certain types of overgrowing bacteria that don't mix well with the probiotics you're taking, a lot of times it can really aggravate your symptoms. You know, it's just it's just a crapshoot, really. I think fermented foods are great. I think long term, I'd love to have everybody tolerating and eating fermented foods. Things like sauerkraut, kimchi, those types of things. I think the best way to get probiotics is through food. But what I will say is that I didn't tolerate sauerkraut for years. And I had to start slow and eat like one strand <laughs> and then two strands. And I mean, it was a long process to tolerate fermented foods. And again, the goal being the benefit is to your immune system and just, just have that kind of logic. Now, when it comes to, when it comes to probiotics in a bottle, um, again, I think it's the same type of thing. And so what I would say is that if you take probiotics like lactobacillus acidophilus, for example, and it does not go well, it makes your symptoms worse, then stop taking it. Um, I found prescriptocyst to be really helpful. It's a soil-based bacteria. A lot of people tolerate that really. We have a visitor. It's all good. I have two kids too. This is my daughter. They're at school winter. right now. Hi, Winter. <laughs> she broke into the room. <laughs> That's fine. I, my kids are uh, almost six and almost four. Oh wow! Yeah, she winters four. Awesome. Yeah, so, I love yeah. prescriptocyst. I think that's that's one of my favorite supplements that I recommend to clients for sure. Uh, it's very powerful. It is, and it's generally well tolerated by the most people. That's the thing is, most other probiotics are kind of like fifty-fifty. Eh, some people tolerate them, some people don't. But pre prescriptocyst tends to be well tolerated by most people, and I still take it. I like it. It's a, it's really beneficial for me personally. Yeah, so uh, why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about how they can win a poop pageant? <laughs> how, do they, how do they go about, Diane Sanfilippo puts it, uh, she has in her book, Practical Paleo, all about mm -hmm. uh, poop pageant, what your poop should look like. Yeah, that's, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a tricky, it's a tricky business. I think it really starts with diet and what you're eating, um, and that's critical. And then from there, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about how to troubleshoot your diet. Use your poop as a guide. If, you know, if you're having diarrhea, listen to your body. If you're having constipation, listen to your body. And uh, we can use it as a guide every single day to keep troubleshooting and tweaking our diet. And once we feel like we've out-troubleshooted out and out-tweaked our diet, 
Start looking at how well you're digesting the food that you're eating. So look at enzymes, troubleshoot your supplements, troubleshoot your stomach acid. And once you've troubleshooted out of that, start looking at root causes. Do you have a parasite? Do you have a bacterial infection? Do you have H. pylori? Do you have SIBO? And all these things that need to be treated with a skilled practitioner. So just keep troubleshooting, keep tweaking as your bowel movements continue to change and evolve. They're going to be telling you, hey, you're on the right track. Hey, you're still missing something. You're doing everything you can with diet. You're digesting your food well, but you're still having diarrhea. Look for parasites. Look for things that, that could also be contributing. So it's, it's really just walking through those three steps I talked about earlier and just putting your health engineer hat on, like put your testing and tweaking hat on. I just can't tell this enough times. Like everybody has to customize and tweak and adjust things over and over and over again until they get it right. And it just takes time. It's one step at a time. It's a process. Well, Jordan, I have a question I like to ask all of my guests. What do you think is the most pressing health issue in the world today? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, most pressing health issue in the world today. I would have to say that for the last hundred or so years, we've been eating, maybe even less than that, We've been eating a recommended type of diet that is clearly not working for most people in Western cultures, and we're not changing fast enough. We're not saying we're wrong fast enough. We're not going, oh, man, we need to change this fast enough. You know, I think that's the biggest epidemic right now. Yeah. Yeah, I know the, the diet that most people are eating in, uh, is in the United States is it's frightening. Uh, the fast food and all the grains and the sugar, etc. And we're infecting the rest of the world. Shush, honey. <laughs> yeah, we're infecting the rest of the world where all, all of our, our dietary habits are going to China and India and um, really, unfortunately, affecting the, the, the health of the world. It's all our fault. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's how I grew up, too, you know? Yeah. Yeah, me too. Well, um, so why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about, you know, where they can find you and, you know, what kind of products you offer and uh, your books and et cetera. And do you do health coaching with people and whatnot? Thanks. Yeah. If you want to come visit us at scdlifestyle.com, that's the best place to join us. Um, hundreds of thousands of people come hang out in our community uh, every month. And we have a pretty big Facebook uh, group of about 60,000 people. And um, so you can come on, hang out with us and join our community. We're all about uh, getting perfect poops. And on our site, we have a free quick start guide. If you want to download that and, and jump on our email list, we, uh, we can help you do that kind of five-day intro diet. And, uh, yeah, just love to have you support us. Yeah, great. Now, listeners, definitely I recommend going and checking that out. Uh, all my clients that have digestive issues, I send them over to your website um, because it's so specialized. Yeah. Everything gut and everything yeah. poop, et cetera. <laughs> Isn't that right, Winter? Yes. Yes. Well, everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. Thanks for joining us, Jordan. That was really, really informative. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks for having me. It's always and, fun. Yeah, and guys, if you want to check me out, you want to check out the Modern Paleo Diet, uh, the uh, Mineral Power Program that I do, you can go look at liveto110.com. And thank you so much for tuning in. If you like what you heard today, definitely uh, go give me a review on iTunes. I would appreciate it so much. And thank you so much for listening to the Live to 110 podcast. <laughs>